everyone will be a developer in the future. And I think this is probably the first uh, contact with what that looks like to people like you and me, yeah. where this idea that we could literally just build anything we want. Welcome to the Marketing AI Show, the podcast that helps your business grow smarter by making artificial intelligence approachable and actionable. You'll hear from top authors, entrepreneurs, researchers, and executives as they share case studies, strategies, and technologies that have the power to transform your business and your career. My name is Paul Reitzer. I'm the founder of Marketing AI Institute, and I'm your host. Welcome to episode 72 of the Marketing AI Show. I'm your host, Paul Reitzer, along with my co-host, Mike Caput. We are here on Monday, November 13th, about 10 a.m. I always timestamp this because you <laughs> never know what's going to happen like an hour after we record this thing. Um, we are a week into the existence of GPTs in the world, so we are going to get into that a little bit more today now that we've had a chance to play around with them. Uh, but first, this episode is brought to us by Accio, the generative business intelligence platform that lets agencies add AI-powered analytics and predictive modeling to their service offering. Accio lets customers chat with their data, create real-time visualizations, and make predictions. Just connect your data, add your logo, and embed an AI analytics service to your site or Slack. Get your free trial at Akio, that's A K K I O dot com slash AI pod. All right, Mike, I know we got a lot to cover today, including the world of GPTs and some AGI. And uh, I don't know, my head's kind of swimming with this one. I, I was like playing around building GPTs this morning. So uh, I'll let you kind of guide us through this one. Go, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. So this week, Paul, we're talking about hands-on experiments with GPTs. Last week, we talked about the introduction of GPTs from OpenAI. As a reminder, these are essentially custom versions of ChatGPT that anyone can create simply using a natural language conversational interface provided in ChatGPT+. Eventually, there will be a GPT store where you can start downloading and sharing the most popular creations that you or others have created. Uh, so th basically, you can create a GPT to do anything you can imagine that you would do with an AI assistant. So we have both been experimenting with GPTs and trying to build some things. It's still very early days, but I wanted us to walk through what we've been working on to give our audience a sense of what some of these GPTs can do, how we're thinking about them in marketing, business, our personal lives. I've already found these to be extremely useful and possibly game-changing in terms of how I go about my own day. So I wanted to kick it over to you, Paul, and say, uh, see exactly how are you thinking about building with GPTs? What have you built so far? And what has your results looked like already? Yeah, it's so we had access what like Wednesday afternoon, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday afternoon. Yeah. And I definitely had that immediate like, oh, my God, I got to jump in and start building some stuff. But my week didn't uh, accommodate the ability for me to just jump in and build some stuff. So uh, se separate story another time. There's some things we're working on at the Institute, some things we're building that I, I won't get into right now. but it took away the four days I, I was hoping to build some GPTs, um, but in a good way. So more to come on that stuff. Um, so I think first we have to address that these things still have flaws. So, you know, I think just even within the first few days of people building with them, you're starting to already see some of the limitations they have, um, some of the challenges, like these things still hallucinate, like no matter how much example data you give them, they'll still make stuff up. Like, they're flawed like ChatGPT is flawed. So just know that, like, I think for the most part, you should think of them as an experimentation, like, you know, low risk level uses. You're not training this thing on your company's data and it's going to be 100% accurate. So it's not, it, you have to use it the way you would use ChatGPT. So whatever guardrails and precautions you take with ChatGPT, take that with these GPTs, including what data you give to it in at the files you upload, the data, you know, all the same precautions still need to be taken. Um, so with that being said, 
what I've seen is, you know, over the weekend, even a lot of people in my network now, granted, I, I kind of have like this AI bubble, I think I live in with, with my network in a lot of cases. So there was people like putting all kinds of cool examples of GPTs up. So I think that one thing for people to do is pay attention to what other people are building as examples. Uh, the other thing you can do is when you go into chat GPT, they have the explore tab now where you can go see, I don't know, it's like 15 or so uh, open AI examples. And so the first thing I did, honestly, was I went in and started just looking at the open AI examples. I saw like, what are they building? How are they using it? Um, because I think to your point, Mike, it's all about like trying to find the functional use of these things for you. Um, and, and so the way we look at it, the way I started to look at it was, what are the processes and frameworks that we either use ourselves internally or that we recommend to people externally? So like when we go out and give talks, I'll always end with like, here's the five essential steps every company needs to take in AI. And so two of the steps that I recommend are responsible AI principles and generative AI policies. So when I was trying to think of something to build first, I was like, okay, well, let me think of something that would be valuable or that I could demo in a talk. So when we're going through and I'm saying, hey, build generative AI policies for your company. Here's an example from Wired Magazine that I like to show. That they're, then they're on their own. And I thought, oh, that'd be pretty cool if I could build a, like a generative AI policy builder that would take what we recommend and actually let someone just go and do it. So for me, it's that beautiful world. And Mike, you and I dealt with this when we were at the agency all those years. You have these ideas, but like we can't build stuff. Like I would have to go get I don't know, whatever like survey tool we'd have to customize, like type form, we'd have to turn it into this. We'd have to go get some massive expensive subscription to some tool building thing just so us non-developers could actually build something. So for me, this is like this freeing thing of like, oh, I can actually go in and start playing around with this and building it. So the first thing I actually tried to do was this idea of a gen AI policy builder. And so one of the things that like, I think I'll share what I got, where I got, and I'll, I'll kind of give a, a tip of where I want to go with this. So when you're building your generative AI policies in your company that dictates how your employees are allowed to use text generation, image generation, audio, uh, code, video, those are like kind of the five main categories we always talk about. There's like these layers people don't think about. And, and so I'm trying to figure out ways to build this in and I'll, maybe next week's episode, I'll, I'll share what I build. But the things you want to go through are like permission levels. So if I'm going to use an AI tool to do something, what level of permission is required to use AI for that intended application? So if I'm, you know, depending on what kind of company you're in, there may be no restrictions on my use. So you can use ChatGPT however you want. It doesn't matter. Do whatever you want with it. There may be some restrictions where it's like, you can use it, but don't put any proprietary or confidential information in the inputs. Or there's every use case requires permission. And I have talked with plenty of company leaders where that is the case, whether they're in nonprofits or they're in financial services companies or healthcare companies, like they need permission from IT and legal for every single use case, every narrow use case that they do. So you think about permission levels, you think about disclosure level, like what are we telling external and internal audiences about our use of this? Are we disclosing it? Is it full disclosure, partial disclosure, no disclosure? Um, Confidential information risk. What's the risk of information getting disclosed, disclosed in the system? Uh, legal risks. You have to look at intellectual property, data privacy, liability, bias and discrimination, regulatory compliance. Like there's all these things that go into it. And then the other one that people don't really think about is like, what is the importance of the accuracy of the output? So if you're using these tools for like ideation and like brainstorming, it's not that critical. Like if it makes a mistake, it makes a mistake, but it hallucinates on some data. It's no big deal. Like you're really just using it for internal, uh, like inspiration. But if you're using this to write a report based on a spreadsheet, it better be correct. Like if you're turning that into someone, if you're giving it to the CEO or if you're using it, you know, for some other uh, external use. So I started thinking about all these like challenges and then I kind of worked back and said, okay, let me just try and simplify this. So again, this isn't publicly available. Maybe, you know, at some point next week, I'll, I'll kind of finish what I'm doing, but I, I honestly built this in like 15 minutes this morning. Um, but what I did is I went into to the builder. And so again, if you haven't done it yet, you can go in and you can just tell it what you want to build or you can go in and, and click the configure button. And so I went into configure, named a gen AI policy builder. The description was define policies to guide your team's responsible use of generative AI text. By the way, responsible use is like the keywords there of generative AI text, image, video, audio, and code tools. And then for the instructions, I actually followed the, um, 
the process that Ethan Mollick recommends. We'll put his blog post in there, but he's got what he called structured prompting. And so he gives like the different things you're supposed to do as part of a structured prompt. And, and so real quick, I'll, I'll walk through that. Those are just for background. Um, so role and goal, you, you tell the AI its role and what the goal is. You give it step-by-step -step instructions. You, you give it expertise. So here's what your background is. You set up constraints and you give personalization, you know, of the output. And so those were kind of the key things I started looking at. And then what I did is I went and I said, so I'll just, I'll read you the instructions. Cause I think it gives a sense of kind of like how, how to think about building these. You are a business leader charged with defining policies that guide your company's use of generative AI text, image, video, audio, and code tools. You will go through a series of questions to determine guidelines for both internal and external applications. Again, I think sometimes people just race to use these tools and they, they think about like, oh, I'm going to write articles and I'm going to disclose it or not. It's like, well, what about internal when you're using it for emails and proposals and reports? And so internal and external is real important here. So then I gave it text generation is the first category. And here's the questions I, I, I had it go through. Are employees allowed to use AI tools to generate external text-based content, such as blog posts, social shares, and ads? Are employees allowed to use AI tools to generate internal text-based content, such as emails, reports, and presentations? Are employees allowed to use AI tools to edit text-based content? And then the last two, do employees have to disclose their use of AI and final outputs for internal audiences? Do employees have to disclose their use of AI and final outputs for external audiences? So I used those same questions for text and then I adapted it for images, but it's basically same premise. You could then do the same for video, audio, and code. I, I haven't written those ones out yet. And then you give it conversation starters. So I just chose AI text tool policies, AI image tool policies. And so then when you go into the builder and you're using it, you could just say, I want AI text tool policies for my company. And so my initial testing of this is it actually worked really well. It did exactly what I instructed it to do. So when I said, you know, give me the text tool policies, it went through and said to develop AI text tool policies for our company, let's address each question in the text generation section, use of AI for external text based. And then it gave an overview. So it actually went through and did this. So my initial reaction is, I think this could be really helpful, especially for these like internal processes where you're still going to edit this. But what changes now is as a, like as a speaker, as like an educator, as someone who's trying to drive AI literacy and responsible adoption, we teach so many things and we, we give like steps for people, but there's still a lot of work to, to execute those things. And so I start looking at these as like, wow. So anytime I say in a talk, like I, I have a talk tomorrow in Boston, when I put up, hey, build generative AI policies for your company, rather than me just saying, here's the Wired Magazine example, I can say, here's a public gen AI policy builder. You can use this tool for free and it'll actually walk you through how to do this. That's how I start to see these tools. And so again, I like the ones that I was excited about, I had, you know, I'm not going to everybody, everything I wanted to build, but generative AI policy, responsible AI principles, I already mentioned, you and I, Mike, run AI strategy workshops all the time. So we teach the use case model that's in our book. I thought there's probably a way to build a tool to do that uh, pretty easily. Mm -hmm. I'm running a strategic AI leader workshop on Friday this week, I think. And so my mind is racing, like, how could I build some tools to make that workshop more interactive so people can actually go through and build these things? So I, a uh, course builder is another one I thought of, like, how, how do we build curriculum for online courses, follow specific standards of like what a good course looks like and how, you know, how to build learning objectives. So I'm immediately just thinking about all of the repetitive, generative, like data-driven things we do all the time mm -hmm. where we're trying to teach someone else a process. And I'm like really excited about the potential. So I'm not looking at these as like, any kind of necessarily replacement for anything we're doing. I mean, I think like podcast summaries might be an interesting one, like writing podcast summaries, um, because we do that already. Mm. Building AI roadmap audits, like there's some cool things, but they're all like enhancements to what we're doing. They create efficiencies for other people and they they really help us like advance our mission of AI literacy, I think. And so that's that's how I'm doing it. So having now built one, again, very early, but understanding now how it, does what it does and seeing a, you know an early output 
I'm really excited about taking a lot of these processes we have both external facing and internal facing and developing some tools where there isn't risk of us giving away confidential information away. We're not uploading files of proprietary data that's going to find its way into OpenAI's foundation models. Like these are just fundamental tools where the knowledge is already out there publicly that I think we could create a lot of value for people where they could go in and, and, and apply these things and, and get value like immediately out of them. I said this on last week's episode, this is maybe the holy grail of tools. If you are a consultant or strategist, in my opinion, you need to be looking at these as aids to education and knowledge if you do anything related to that for a living. Yeah, and it. I think the thing we have to keep stressing is like, this is this is like an alpha release. Like th this is just a prelude to more intelligent agents that can take actions and do things at a much higher level of accuracy and stuff like that. So I, I know you played around a little bit, Mike. Did you have any initial use cases or responses or outputs that you, you thought were fascinating? So that is very similar to you in my reaction of being incredibly impressed with what I was able to do in a very short amount of time. So the way at least initially I look at these is I want to clone myself and my thought processes on my best day and okay. for cool. anything that I do, right? Because I'm not always having my best day in terms of being the <laughs> sharpest or most on point, especially early in the morning, right? So I naturally gravitated towards, okay, what's the first you know, cognitively intensive thing I do in my day and it's planning my day and planning my day for me. I won't get into all the details, but I have quite a few goals, habits, and systems that I use at the beginning of my day, the first 30 or 60 minutes even to really carefully plan my day to get as much out of it as possible. And that actually takes like a fair amount of work. So that's where I started building a daily planning assistant. And I have a lot of work to do, but in probably 15 minutes, like you mentioned, I had a really solid assistant where I say, hey, go ahead and plan my day. And it knows because I've given it a pretty extensive knowledge document. I'm lucky enough to have been a weirdo and documented all this stuff already. The steps that I take to think about my day, which things are most important, which are least important, what kind of time commitment a lot of things take, what my daily schedule that I found really works for me looks like. For instance, I tend to try to at least block off, you know, four hours a day of really intensive deep work. So no distractions, phone on, do not disturb actually focusing. I found that to be really, really helpful. Not everyone does that, but that's how I structure a lot of my most important priorities. It knows that. And I got very quickly to an hour by hour schedule for my day that reflects very closely what takes me about 30 or 60 minutes to come up with every morning. And it's extremely valuable time. If I never shortened that by a second, it's still the most important thing I do in a day but it took 30 seconds using this tool. But most importantly, it's all this recurring stuff that I have to think about and organize often right when I wake up that I now don't have to bother with as much. And so I can reallocate that limited bandwidth to actually to other things that require more creativity or could be solved better if I had more bandwidth in a day. So a couple of things about that experiment did jump out to me. And the first is that it really felt like everyone is now just a product manager. I really had to sit down and almost create um, like, a pro like a brief describing the end product I wanted to create. It wasn't super extensive, but it really helped me organize my thinking around what I wanted to see in this instead of just willy nilly kind of prompting it to try to get results. and. Another thing that jumped out is it really did just feel like I am coding using language. And yeah. that was exciting to me as someone that's always been technologically minded, but never went very deep on learning how to program beyond some basics. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity for a writer or a strategist to be able to sit down. And the one thing I can do with ease is write pages and pages and pages of documentation about what I want this thing to do how I might be thinking about the problems and refine it over time. And it really just produces incredible results 
doing. So I found this to be just stunning already. Obviously, it has limitations. You have to invest time to figure out the best ways to get the results you want. Um, I'm still refining and learning. This is just day one, in my opinion, of yeah. experimenting with this technology. But I was pretty blown away. And I've already found the half a dozen ways in my personal life that I think I could be creating a few different GPTs to save myself immense amounts of time. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it really is. And again, I, I don't get too hyped on AI advancements. Like sometimes there's stuff that's just really impressive, but I try and kind of stay pretty level about all this stuff. You know, this is one where I, I just, I don't think it's overhyped. Like I, I really think it's just the very, very early days of the tech, but yeah, I mean, just as a, like as an entrepreneur, as a, a business leader, as an educator, like there's so many ways to think about this. And, and I think you touched on it, but like, you know, a lot of times as a, like a business leader, you're trying to convey processes and like chain of thought and like ways for people to think about things, like whether it's problem solving or, or, or ways to go about, produ you know, producing an assignment. Um, and so much of what we do is just like, listen, here's the 10 steps, go through these 10 steps or ask yourself these seven questions before you do this strategy doc. And to be able to just codify that into a simple tool is like, it, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, so to take the way your mind kind of works and be able to train a tool on it is just like, we've just never had that ability before. Like I said, without, you know, we, have, we have a tool we, we built. Uh, together but i mean we pay like twenty five thousand dollars a year for the tool mm. and like it doesn't it's it you have to go through a master class to build anything in it like to build a simple form is like crazy and and here we have this ability so i think that it also is a preview of like we've talked about everyone will be a developer in the future and i think this is probably the first uh contact with what that looks like to people like you and me yeah. Where this idea that we could literally just build anything we want, and it might be six months from now, a year from now, but I think like Replit and their mission of like a billion developers and, you know, open AI, putting these kinds of tools in people's hands. I really think it's just a preview of how we're going to be able to build whatever we can imagine in the future. And it's just, yeah, I mean, it's really cool to sort, sort of start to sit down and think about. So I know like with the Thanksgiving holiday coming up, like I'm going to take some time off and I could see myself just like playing around with these things and building some fun ones for the kids and building some cool things for the company and for myself. So yeah, I, again, if you haven't done it yet, like it's, I, I, it's obviously Mike and I are both pretty passionate that this is something worth spending some time experimenting with and looking at some of the cool things other people are building for inspiration. I, I think it's going to, You'll be pleasantly surprised at what you can do with it. Yeah. And as a final note here, given our backgrounds, Paul, I think if you're an agency owner, you need to be on this yesterday because I would have just killed, to your point, to have one of these we had trained on all of our processes, strategic thinking, the ability to get new hires onboarded and actually have them almost have like a scalable version of us as, as an assistant. Yeah. would have been worth its weight in gold. Yep. All right. So our second big topic today is about a new paper that's out that actually proposes a framework for classifying the capabilities and the behavior of what we call artificial general intelligence. And we'll talk about the definition there for a second in a second, but we're really talking about broadly AI systems that are smarter than humans at a wide variety of tasks. Now, this is notable not only for the topic around AGI, but because this paper is authored, co-authored by Shane Legg, who is one of the co-founders of DeepMind, a major AI lab. Now, DeepMind is part of Google after being acquired way back in 2014. And Legg's uh, profile in X actually lists him as the chief AGI scientist at Google DeepMind. Now, the paper's topic is important because people like Legg believe it is not only possible to achieve AGI, but it, it, it also could be coming very soon. 
Leg just gave an interview on the Dwarkesh podcast where he said he expects AGI to be achieved as soon as 2028. So this paper goes through a possible system for evaluating just how advanced an AGI system could be when we get it and classifying the capabilities of current systems uh, basically on a scale like you might evaluate a self-driving car. What level of intelligence and autonomy do current AI systems have? So in the mind of people like Leg, this is not speculative or science fiction. It's a serious attempt to classify and evaluate better than human systems, systems that we could have very, very soon. So Paul, to kick this off, why are people like Leg trying to build this framework to evaluate AGI system? Yeah, so I mean, this is a topic I've been fascinated by, fascinated by for a long time. It was a topic that I would say was a little bit fringe and even taboo in the AI research world until a few years ago. And it was a topic that I generally avoided bringing up um, within our stuff because I just didn't think people were really ready for it. Because until people experienced any form of AI, the idea of AGI was just too science fiction for everyone, I think. So the, the reason it's, it matters is you touched on Shane is a, a major player here. He coined the term AGI back probably around 2006, 2007 for a series of papers on a, a book that was put together on a series of papers about AI. Um, and he founded uh, DeepMind with Demis Hassabis, who we've talked about many times, who's the CEO of, of Google DeepMind and Mustafa Saliman, who is now the co-founder and CEO of Inflection AI. So uh, Shane is a major player in, in AI. We don't talk about him as much as some of the other founders, but he is a key player here. So I think what's happening is AGI is becoming much more mainstream. So you're going to hear that term all the time. If you watched the OpenAI uh, event where they introduced GPTs and everything else last Monday, um, when Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, came on stage and did his somewhat awkward, like two minutes on stage with Sam, when Satya went to leave, Sam said, I look forward to building AGI together to Satya. So all the major research labs have been pursuing AGI for years, and it seems like they generally uh, agree that it is within reach. So for us, the challenge has been trying to explain AGI in a cohesive way when none of these labs seem to agree with what it is. So the way I have explained it, and I'm, I was kind of going through their paper today to try and see, like, is, are they on the same page as we've been, is like right now AI is capable of very specific things. Like it's trained to do very specific tasks. And in some cases, it's just better than humans. So like AI is better than humans at chess. So it's a narrow application of AI, but it's superhuman at that application. Um, and so when we look at the future impact of AI on knowledge work in particular, we think about the idea of cognitive tasks, tasks that require thinking, reasoning, understanding, language. And so AGI, is the idea that you have these general purpose AIs that are near or at human level in many cognitive tasks. So you have a single AI that can win at chess, can beat the grandmaster at chess, and it can also maybe write a research paper. And then it can jump over and do a Sudoku puzzle. And then it can take a medical exam. And then it can go get, you know, a 1600 on the SAT exam. So a single AI that is generally really, really good or above human level at almost every cognitive task. That's how I've thought about AGI for years. And it seems like that jives with what they're talking about. So in the paper, and I know we'll dig into kind of their different uh, levels of AI, they say AGI is an important and sometimes controversial concept in computing research used to describe an AI system that is at least as capable as a human at most tasks. So the challenge I have seen, and again, I've listened to probably every interview that Demis, Mustafa, Shane, Dario Amade, like it's, I, I listen to podcasts nonstop where there's interviews with these people. And anytime you ask them to define AGI, I have yet to hear one of them say in like 10 words, this is what it is. 
Mm. They're always like, oh, it's a tricky thing to define. And so I think the value of this paper is to start to put some hopefully universal guardrails around what exactly is it so that we can measure our progress toward it. Um, I know I listened to an interview, I think it was Sam Altman, just like a week ago or two weeks ago, where it was the same deal. It's like, well, what are the milestones we should watch for? And I think generally what you should expect is there isn't going to be this moment. And actually, the, 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 the our Catch podcast with Shane is phenomenal. Like, I, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend listening to it. I think what seems like it's universally accepted at this time is there isn't going to be this moment where a press conference is held that says, we did it, we're, we, we achieved AGI because X happened. They see it as this progressive thing where over time, you'll start to look at a bunch of signals and say, I, I think it's there. Um, you, I think you mentioned the, the sparks of AGI paper from Microsoft after GPT-4 came out where they're like, it seems like there's some elements of AGI within chat GPT. Like we're starting to see GPT-4 showing signs of this. But again, and from the outside, like, what does that mean showing mm -hmm. signs of it? Does it mean we're almost there? Does it mean we're not there? So I think the significance here is AGI is going to play a major role in, in the future of humanity, the future of knowledge work, the future of business society. What is it and when do we get there? are really important for us to prepare for it. So I've, I've advised a number of like technology companies and some other companies that they really need like an AGI horizons team within their organization, because I think you need some people who are looking beyond the one to two years of what's generative AI going to be when we have GPT-5 or Google Gemini. Mm. And they need to start looking and saying, what's the world going to look like? What is our business going to look like? What's our industry going to look like when AGI is here? And Shane and others seem to think it's within this decade. OpenAI certainly would fall under the umbrella of thinking it's possible within this decade. So it does seem more sci-fi because it kind of is, but that doesn't mean it's any less real, real or that the probability of it being achieved is any less just because it seems really abstract at the moment. Um, if we rewound two years ago and I said, hey, AI is going to be able to write everything. You're going to be able to build your own tools. like you'd have thought I was crazy. Mm. Uh, and yet that's exactly where we are. And so I think AGI is going to follow a similar pattern. Right now, it seems really weird um, and abstract to think about. But a year from now, two years from now, it, it may be a very real thing we're dealing with in society. I'd encourage everyone to take a stab, perhaps with AI assistance, at reading the full paper. It's about 19 pages, much less when she removed the citations. It's actually dense, but not super technical. It's understandable for anyone. But on page six of the paper, they actually have a nifty table that talks through their levels of AGI. Now, I'd recommend you go check it out for yourself, but just really briefly, they kind of look at it as rows and columns. So imagine rows where you have the level of performance that they rate AI systems on level zero, no AI level one emerging, which is equal to, or somewhat better than an unskilled human. And they go up multiple levels all the way to level five, superhuman outperforms 100% of humans. Now the key here is what would be in the columns. They split up AI systems into narrow systems, which are clearly scoped tasks or sets of tasks that the AI can do. So you talked about AI playing chess would fall into a narrow AI system and then general AI, which is able to perform a wide range of non-physical tasks, including metacognitive abilities like learning new skills. Now on this rubric, Leg and the team have really only identified emerging AGI in level one. So equal to or somewhat better than an unskilled human. And they would classify things like ChatGPT, Bard and Llama 2 in that category. Now, the other levels of competency, level two through five, they say, look, we do not have AGI today that is competent, you know, better than 50 in the 50th percentile of skilled adults, expert, 90th percentile of skilled adults, virtuoso, 99th percentile, and superhuman outperforms 100% of people. So it does seem, Paul, like they have made an effort here to demystify a little bit of what we're talking about when we talk about AGI. And when you look at this table, 
do you agree that you start to see, oh my gosh, I understand now why they're saying they think we could get to some pretty significant AGI in the next, say, 10 years? Yeah. You know, I think, again, download the doc, go look at it. Uh, it'll make a lot more sense when you're looking at it. The more I, time I spend with this chart, the more I like it. Because I think it it actually makes it really understandable. So like level three expert in narrow AI, Grammarly would be an example. Grammarly is like better at spelling and grammar checking than 90% of humans who do that task for a living. Um, but when we look about general intelligence, there's nothing there. If you've watched the movie AlphaGo, which is the documentary about, you know, uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo system beating World Go champion, they put that at level four virtuoso, meaning it's better than 99% of people who are skilled at that task. And then they go into like level five alpha fold, which predicts the folding of proteins at a superhuman level. So you start, I love that they like show examples of what they mean at that level. Like what would be an example of level three? Hmm. So I think this is, it's really good. I, I think this will be very helpful moving forward. And I do believe that, you know, by this time next year, AGI will be a much wider understood um, concept and that it'll be a, uh, um, in your life, in your business life, in your personal life, it'll start having much more meaning and application because I, I am, from everything I've read and learned and heard, I, I don't see any reason why AGI isn't a, a viable thing by the end of this decade. Like it, it just yeah. does seem we're on that path. So in our third big topic today, an AI startup called Humane just released what it's calling the AI pin, which is a wearable device that clips to the lapel of your shirt and allows you to talk to a virtual AI assistant powered by OpenAI and Microsoft's technology. Now, this release is getting a ton of buzz because Humane was actually founded by ex-Apple veterans, including some people who worked on a somewhat popular consumer device called the iPhone. So the company has raised $241 million from people like Sam Altman at OpenAI and Microsoft, among other investors. And their goal here is to create an AI wearable. Now, this wearable pin can do things like compose messages in your tone of voice. It can summarize your email inbox and it can take pictures which Humane's AI can then scan with computer vision in order to perform tasks. One example they give is you could snap a picture of the food in front of you and get the nutritional content of it given to you by your AI assistant. Now, the AI pin is available in the U.S. starting this week, November 16th, and it will cost $699. So, Paul, first up, what was your initial impression of this product? I try to be so <laughs> neutral on these things. And this, this is another one. Just, I, I just can't. So anybody who listened to our episode a few back, we talked about the rewind pendant, similar idea. It's a wearable, you wear it around your neck. You people around you have no idea what it is or why you're wearing it and whether or not it's recording anything. And there's all these ethical questions related to the product. And the, this is, I, I just felt the same way about this. So I, I was actually shocked, like knowing who these founders are, like major players in, in, from Apple, mm. knowing their investors and how much funding they have, that that's how they launched this product as a, like a marketing and communications professional. It, it just hurt to see. It, it was maybe the worst product launch video I've ever seen. Um, so my initial take was they needed to hire an ethicist and a communications team because who, how, how are they decided to do that? I just don't get it. So if you watch the video, it was like 11 minutes or something. Maybe it was a little longer. I, I couldn't make it all the way through. So I don't know how long <laughs> it actually was. They led with like all these technical specs that mean nothing to like the average user, unless they're only selling this thing to like techniques. I don't even know what they were saying. And then they're like, I don't know, they're just talking about the features and like, there's no, why would I use this thing? And then they're showing like examples that were just the most ridiculous examples that had no value to me as a consumer. So I, I, I don't know, I, I just, I don't like the AI wearables category, not like Fitbit, Fitbit's great, watches are great. Like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that are supposed to be observing the world around you and recording the world around you when people may or may not know it's happening 
Um, I'm not a fan of the category. And my, my initial take on this product was, I don't understand why I would buy this when I have a phone and a watch. Mm. Like there's, it's all redundant. Like it does nothing other than record the world around me that my phone and my watch don't already do. And I don't want to record the world around me because I feel like it's unethical to just be recording people. So, and then there's like the form factor of like, you got to take it off and like, where do I put it on? I don't, I don't know. It's just, it just seemed like a Saturday Night Live skit, honestly. <laughs> like I, that was my initial take. Is like, this, this could just be a Saturday Night Live skit. They don't even have to like redo it. Just put this on Saturday Night Live. So I, I you know, was having a back and forth with our friend Tim Hayden on Twitter about it. And, you know, what I, what I said, and I ended up talking to Tim and Tim's got amazing perspective on this. And he sees a little bit out into the future of where this category could go. And so, you know, his, his feedback was really valuable. My, my comments that I made in a, a series of threads, one was as I'll just read it as a consumer who loves tech, I have zero interest in this AI wearables category as an investor. I would not invest in it as someone who watches the AI tech space very closely. I'm curious and admire their entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, but I think this product is dead on arrival. The second one I said, and this was maybe a little harsh, the product, actually, no, it's not. This is actually factual. <laughs> this product feels like Alexa 1.0 with a camera, crappy projector, and a sound bubble, whatever the sound bubble is. Again, I could be completely wrong here, but I get the concept that next-gen large language models in some wearable could be significant. Guess I still see a powerful large language model on my phone as the play. So I admit fully, like I may just be completely wrong. And this wearables category may be the hottest thing ever. And they may sell, a, you know, millions of these pins. Um, but I, I just don't see it right now. And, and I, 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 there's no way in the world I'm spending any, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wear one of these things if someone gave me $600 to put one on. <laughs> like it's just z zero interest in it as a, a product. So. Again, I, I respect and admire their willingness to go out kind of in the frontier and, and try something, but I just think the category is a bad idea. Right and it sounds like for the category to really take off would require a pretty significant change in consumer and social behavior, which is yeah. not impossible, but it's a pretty big ask to suddenly flip a switch and we're all surveilling each other. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, the product launch that came to mind, I may be dating myself here, but the Segway scooter, like, remember how groundbreaking that thing was supposed to be? And like, we were, it was going to transform, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> transportation and, and it became this like really interesting niche product for like security guards. And I don't know who else they sell the thing to, and it's still around, but like, I feel like that's this, like maybe there's some version of this pin or pendant or whatever that has like really cool applications for medical professionals or uh, I don't know, senior citizens or like something like I could see some sort of vertical solution to this, but as a consumer product that I assume is expected to sell millions of, of units, no way. Like it just not in this form, like there's gotta be something else to this. So I don't know. I kind of uh, feeling I got, was kind of like magic leap. Like we heard for years how magic leap was just going to change everything. And Everyone was investing in it from Disney and whatever. And I feel like that's kind of what this is. It's just like, we were waiting and waiting and waiting. And it's like, oh, that's it. Like, that is what the projector looks like. And I don't know. It, it, uh, it was bad. Yeah. Google Glass also comes to mind. Yeah, but even that I could see, like, I get the glasses, like yeah. you, people wear glasses, you know, the Ray-Bans with Meta, there's, you know, everybody's going to still try the glasses thing, Vision Pro, like Apple will get in the game on the glass. Like I could see glasses eventually working because the form factor is there and it's, it's like a thing you see, mm -hmm. but to think that people are just going to start wearing, wearing like these pins on things and. I don't know. I think it's just, it's stretching, like you said, like computer, consumer behavior um, would have to change so dramatically to wear these things. And like, I almost feel like you'd have to get, I guess in a way, like kind of like GoPro, like, I don't know, maybe there's a market for like the GoPro market where it's like a mm. smaller version of that camera. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't, I just don't see the market. I would love to see their pitch deck of like <laughs> who they're selling this to and how.
All right, let's dive into some rapid fire topics here. First up, Bill Gates just published an extensive article that claims, quote, AI is about to completely change how you use computers. And in this article, he argues that the rise of AI agents, which he defines as, quote, something that can respond to natural language and can accomplish many different tasks based on its knowledge of the user, that these agents will transform how we interact with software and with computers. He makes the bold claim that agents are not only going to change how everyone interacts with computers, they're also going to upend the software industry, bringing about the biggest revolution in computing since we went from typing commands to tapping on icons. So, Paul, this is a pretty notable personality to be weighing in on the future of technology. Do you see Gates as being right? Are AI agents going to change the game? Certainly not alone in that opinion. I mean, it, it is what we've talked about AI agents a lot recently on the show. I think I said like 2024 is sort of the year to watch this time next year. I think we're going to have very good agents that are actually doing real tasks for businesses. Um, you can go, we'll share the link in the show notes, but Adept, which we've talked about before, I think they've raised north of 400 million. This is their thing. They're trying to build like action transformers. Um, you can go and look at their experiments. So they have Adept experiments, which I just joined the wait list for, where it'll show you it doing it within a CRM system. What you do is right now you program it to take actions. So I've used the example of HubSpot. Like if I want to send an email in HubSpot, it's 21 clicks. I would train the AI on those 21 clicks. And then instead of me having to go do it, I would just say, run the email workflow and it'll go do the 21 clicks. So it recognizes the buttons. It knows the slider scales. It knows the form fills. So you teach it everything. And so I think right now is what is happening is we're in the training mode where we're having to kind of program these things, but then their computer vision and their action ability lets them go do it over and over and over again. So you teach it once and then it goes and does it. Eventually it'll just learn by watching you. So, and, and I think by, by, by eventually, I mean like next year, it'll learn by watching you. So yes, I think AI agents are a massive play. I think if you are a software company and you're not planning for this within your product roadmap and user experience, you are going to miss just like you missed with generative AI. So I think you have to be preparing for AI agents. Um, there will be a Chad GPT level moment, I think, with AI agents where they all of a sudden do this stuff. And as a software company, you cannot get caught sleeping again. And then as a, like a business leader, as a practitioner, I think just study the space and be ready for the fact that the way you do things is probably going to evolve within the next year. And these things are going to become very capable. So the actor strike in Hollywood has come to an end as the Actors Guild has reached an agreement finally with film studios. Now, what's notable about this story is that the use of generative AI by the studios became a huge sticking point between actors and the studios during negotiations. Um, both sides went back and forth on how AI could or couldn't be used to produce digital likenesses of actors. Now, on Tuesday, it sounds like the studios budged and agreed to adjust AI language in their proposed deal. So the final details of the deal are not still yet fully clear, but it does suggest that the actors did move the needle in their favor more towards increased protections around AI. Now, Paul, this is notable just because it's a really interesting example of how AI is becoming a very real and present issue for a lot of different types of professionals, especially in contract negotiations. Can you unpack for us the concerns that actors have about AI and kind of why this matters more broadly. Yeah. I mean, just at the like broader implications are, this is a profession where they're looking out ahead and saying, wow, AI is going to be able to do this. So extras and backgrounds, if you just digitally create twins of them, like you don't ever have to pay for extras again, or you pay a one-time fee and then you have the use of that person for, you know, eternity. Um, th there's lots of concerns about where the tech is and where the tech is going. And so I think that it sounds like their union did a pretty good job of looking out ahead and saying, this could be our one chance to negotiate this right. If we come back to the table three to five years from now, 
we could have lost all of this capability and kind of given away everything. So I'll be really interested to read the final details and see, but I, I think we're going to see a lot more of this moving into next year where different unions are sort of stepping in and trying to protect um, the future of those workers because it's, again, AGI is four years, five years away. Like, what does that mean to all of these different workers across different industries? So, yeah, I think it'll sort of set a precedent that you may then see some quick actions early next year where other unions start to try and protect uh, their workers in a similar way. So Meta announced this week that it is going to require advertisers disclose when AI generated or AI altered content is being used in political ads to depict or imagine events that never happened. AI generated content depicting fake people is also going to need to be disclosed under these new rules. According to Meta President of Global Affairs, Nick Clegg, quote, in the new year, advertisers who run ads about social issues, elections, and politics with Meta will have to disclose if image or sound has been, has been created or altered digitally, including with AI, to show real people doing or saying things they haven't done or said. However, it sounds like the AI usage for editing that has nothing really to do with the claims in an ad or its message, so like cropping or color correcting, does not need to be disclosed. So Paul, I know that you see kind of deep fake election content generated by AI as a really serious near-term threat to society. So how effective do you think this kind of measure will be in counteracting that? I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm glad they're doing it. I think we're going to see more actions like this. I We'll have to double check terms, but I think OpenAI doesn't allow you to use ChatGPT for like political stuff. Mm. Um, so, you know, I think this, there's a couple ways to do this. One is at the, like the model level where the companies that <clears throat> create the image video uh, text, like Runway, for example, and video and Mid Journey. <clears throat> I can't imagine Mid Journey putting any guardrails in place, but like that they would detect political content in the creation process and shut it down. So if you're asking for political figures, uh, if you're using political language, that they just wouldn't allow their systems to be used for that. Now, open source sort of ruins that. And I, I'm sure the open source models can be used for whatever you want, which is one of the arguments for closed models is if we determine that it's dangerous for these models to be used in politics, and the open source just lets everybody go at it. Does it really matter how many, you know, closed models shut it down? So, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're going to see a lot more actions being taken, especially with the executive order from the White House. I think there's going to be more pressure on these different uh, companies. So the foundation companies and then the social companies that allow the dissemination of that information and content. Um, I, I I guess it'll probably make some impact. I, I don't think it saves us from a train wreck of an election cycle. I, I, I just think people should prepare themselves for um, a, a really messy next 12 months <laughs> in the United States. Uh, I personally have already like stopped going into my news feed. I just, mm. I can't, for my, my own mental well being, I, I can't go in my news feed more than like once a day right now. And I just imagine it's going to get worse once all the fake stuff starts really emerging. So I don't know. Take care of yourselves out there. Like, don't, <laughs> don't let it is what it is. Like, it, this is the reality we are going to be in. And I think um, you have to understand your limits uh, and, and know um, when to sort of step back from this stuff. And this is one that I, I do, it, it bothers me a lot. And I, I do have to be very careful with how much I expose myself to it because I know what's coming and I, I'm just not, not there where I can like deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. It sounds like some other companies are waking up to this threat as well, because this week, Microsoft also announced what it's calling five new steps to protect electoral processes in the United States and other countries where critical elections will take place in 2024. These steps include things like Microsoft is actually launching content credentials as a service, which is going to help candidates and campaigns maintain greater control over their content and their likenesses. 
Um, this is basically a tool that allows users to digitally sign and authenticate media. Second, Microsoft is forming a team to help political campaigns navigate cybersecurity issues related to AI. Third, they're providing increased security and tech support for democratic governments that encounter security issues with technology during their elections. They're also saying they're, quote, using their voice as a company to support legislative and legal changes that add to the protection of campaigns and electoral processes from deepfakes and other harmful uses of new technologies. Interestingly, that includes endorsing in the U.S. a bipartisan bill introduced by Senators Klobuchar, Collins, Hawley, and Coons that is related to protecting elections from deceptive AI content. Fifth and finally, Microsoft is empowering voters with authoritative election information on Bing from what they consider credible sources. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, which of these measures, if any, did you see as significant at all? I mean, they're all very good signs. I, I think we need to see all the major tech companies doing things like this and hopefully actually executing them and, and following through on them. I, 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 I think in total, if all the big tech companies are moving in the same direction and working to protect the elections and democracy, that gives me hope. Like I, I know people are thinking about this a lot. I know a lot of resources are going to it. And I just, I mean, the optimist in me wants to know this stuff's going to make a difference and an impact. And at the end of the day, it's better than no action. So I think I look at it not necessarily as one individual item, but more as just the totality of it seems like they're taking a comprehensive approach to this, or at least on paper they are. And I, I hope more companies, you know, step up and, and follow similar paths um, to give us the best chance <laughs> for this election cycle to not be a train wreck. So we've got some pretty big rumors about Amazon coming up here. Amazon is training a mammoth new large language model codenamed Olympus, according to reports from Reuters. Uh, sources familiar with this project told Reuters that the model has two trillion parameters. That would make it one of the largest models that's in existence today. There's speculation that GPT-4, as a comparison, has one trillion parameters. Um, interestingly, the team running point on Olympus is reportedly led by someone named Rohit Prasad, the former head of Alexa. So, Paul, when you read this, how big a deal is this? Understanding, of course, there's still just rumors. I mean, Amazon's not going to sit on the sidelines for this one. We've talked about you know, earlier this year, they came out with Amazon Bedrock, which is like a collection of language models. So if, you're our, if your data is already in AWS, you can go pick, I don't remember which ones are in there. I think Anthropic's in there. I think Cohere's in there. Their own model, I believe it's called Titan, is in there. Um, so AWS has the data. They, that you trust, you know, it's in their cloud. Why not connect with some language models and train it on data with the provider you already trust? And, you know, if they see um, an opportunity to build a better model than what's currently offered through third parties of their own, they obviously have the bandwidth um, or the compute power to train something more powerful. So, yeah, I, I mean, it makes total sense. I would have been more surprised if they didn't do something like this. And so now what we can look forward to the rest of 2023 or into 2024 is whatever OpenAI is building. <laughs> but if, I'm sure they're working on GPT-5, whatever that is. And whenever it comes out, we know Google's working on Gemini. Uh, we know now Amazon's working on Olympus. We know Microsoft is working on their own model, so they're not as reliant on OpenAI. We know... Um, who am I missing? Microsoft, Google, Amazon, NVIDIA is playing in the game. Like, it, it's just, there's going to be m inflection, I know, is training a much larger model. Anthropic's training a larger model. Like, mm. everyone is training massive models right now. Grok, you know, Twitter, aired an interview. Um, Lex Friedman podcast had Elon on it. I just listened to that interview, and he said they trained um, Grok on 8,000 GPUs from NVIDIA. The original inflection Pi was trained on 6,000 GPUs from NVIDIA. Mm. So, I mean, we're going to get six, seven, eight. There's probably a Llama 3 in training for Meta. The next generation of foundation models are, are coming, and they're going to be trained on massive amounts of data and massive compute power. Um, so 2024 is going to be nuts. I, I don't mm -hmm. think we're going to have a lack of things to talk about on this show. <laughs>
So in our final topic for today, Google has started to roll out some more AI features across its Performance Max campaigns within Google Ads. So within Performance Max, you can now get AI to suggest and generate headlines, create descriptions, and generate images, as well as allow you to provide text prompts to generate more assets. So to scale up and spin off assets from what you've created. You'll also now have access to AI powered image editing right within Google ads. And as part of the announcement, Google also noted that all the images created with generative AI in Google ads, including via performance max will be identified as AI generated using the synth ID tool, which we covered on a previous episode. This basically invisibly watermarks images that are AI generated. Now, Paul, the big question I had here is this really seems like another case of a major platform releasing AI capabilities that essentially obsolete some of the features in third-party tools and startups. Yeah, wasn't it last week we were talking about Amazon doing this with like their yes. product listings? Meta yes. obviously does this already. Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is just... You know, when you start mixing it with performance data where it knows what's working specifically for your brand, your channels, um, yeah, like th this is just a, not even a sign of things to come. This is what's happening. Like if you're running ads on any network or through any of these platforms and you're not using these tools, like they're there for you and, mm -hmm. and they're going to be extremely prevalent, you know, again, a year from now, it'll be weird to not use these tools and just rely on the AI. So. Yeah, lot, lots of cool tools rolling out. And I know we're, we didn't have it in this week's rapid fire, but like we're such huge, huge fans of Descript and they keep rolling out all these AI tools. And just for our podcast alone, like we just had Clara and our team do a brief last week on all the AI tools within Descript. So again, like when you're looking at where do we start, mm. one of the best ways to start with AI, and we'll kind of end with this, is like go look at the tech you already have and see what tools they're they're rolling out with AI that can drive efficiency and creativity across your team because they're all going to be doing it and it's going to be a nonstop cycle moving forward. That is a great note to end on here, Paul. And right before we sign off, I want to just make a few very quick announcements that might create some more value for our listeners. First up, uh, we've completely revamped our newsletter that goes out every week. It is now themed around this week in AI. So we cover both the stories we've discussed on today's episode, as well as all the other news, links, and information that we weren't able to cover in this episode. So it's really, really helpful if you want to stay on top of everything going on in AI. So if you go to marketingaiinstitute.com forward slash newsletter, you can go ahead and subscribe to that. I do also want to encourage you to subscribe to our podcast regularly. If you listen regularly, you may as well get notified the moment we come out with a new episode. They drop on Tuesday mornings. And go ahead and be sure to share the episode and the show if you really are getting value out of the content. Last but not least, I want to communicate maybe to some of our newer audience members that Marketing AI Institute does a phenomenal amount of public speaking. Myself and Paul are usually on the road in any given week. And we do a bunch of speaking engagements to address a really profound need in the industry. And the need is this, AI is about to have a huge impact on our industry and on our businesses. But too few business leaders understand how they need to start adapting to survive and thrive in the age of AI. Now, all of our talks are designed to help you do just that by helping companies build a competitive advantage with AI by giving you highly actionable and engaging content. So if you've been looking for a speaker for your event or you want someone to come in and speak with your team about the opportunities that AI presents, please feel free to reach out to either Paul or myself on LinkedIn, or you can go right to our website, marketingaiinstitute.com, go to about and click speaking and find all the information on that. Paul, thank you again for breaking down this week in AI for us. We really, really appreciate it. Oh, good stuff as always. And uh, with that, I need to go catch a flight to Boston for a speaking gig. <laughs> Safe right. travels. Thanks, everyone. We'll talk to you. Uh, oh, next week is Thanksgiving, isn't it? We'll, re we'll record. We'll, we'll have an episode next week. So uh, I don't know when we're going to record it, but we'll be back for an episode next week. 
Uh, thanks again. As always, everyone, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Marketing AI Show. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe on your favorite podcast app. And if you're ready to continue your learning, head over to marketingaiinstitute.com. Be sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, check out our free monthly webinars, and explore dozens of online courses and professional certifications. Until next time, stay curious and explore AI.